Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and I'd like to welcome you to this talk. And this talk will be on CT of incidental omas, what you need to know. And there's no doubt um, incidental omas have taken on a life of their own recently. Um, what is an incidental oma? I remember I wrote an article a couple years ago about incidental omas of the adrenal, and I thought the person who invited me had made up a word, but it's a real word. It's an unsuspected finding in an organ or organ system that was not the primary source of the patient's presentation. And the key with incidental findings is to determine whether they're significant or not, whether or not they can just be left alone, or whether or not you need to do further evaluation. Incidental omas, in fact, have made a big play because they've made it to Wikipedia. I don't know how many of you are in Wikipedia, but incidental loma is. And you can see that um, it really goes into detail about incidental omas. Even in the lay press beyond Wikipedia, New York Times talks about the problem with medical imaging that CT scans often turn up incidental problems that are better left untreated. So that indeed is a challenge. Now, one of the challenges I find is particularly dealing with referring physicians. And what I noticed is that sometimes you'd have a finding on CT, and I might say, well, it's of no importance, don't worry about it. Somebody else might have read it and said it is of importance. And I kind of noticed that for these incidental findings, as in many things in radiology, you may have 12 people reading in your department, and you meet together, and you thought perhaps everyone says the same thing, but the fact is perhaps not. And so we decided to do a study where we looked at a number of incidental findings, and we looked at not only our own department, but looked at three institutions, Hopkins, NYU, and uh, Stanford. We took very simple findings from a thyroid nodule to a calcified or a non-calcified lung nodule, coronary artery calcification, adrenal, pancreas lesion, 12 things that all of us see on a daily basis, or almost on a daily basis, and we asked, what would you do? And out of those 12 things, it was somewhat amazing. There was only 70% or greater agreement for six findings. The thyroid nodule, the uh, postmenopausal cyst, the Fleischner criteria for a non-calcified nodule, the coronary calcification, and short segment intersusceptions and splenic cysts. But that was only 70%. It wasn't even 100%. And what you realize was that on six of the things, there was very little agreement. And so you realize that even within a department, but across departments, there's no agreement. And what's very important, we thought then, is that individual departments should develop guidelines to ensure consistent recommendations based on evidence. And in fact, it's gotten to the point, there was an article published that uh, this Cole and Feister had the idea, perhaps since there are incidental findings, which may require further workup, that perhaps in the consent form for a CT, we should say that an incidental finding can potentially be discovered and can lead to all sorts of havoc. Well, no one is doing that, but it does make the point that incidental findings are important. Now, how often do you see an incidental finding? Well, there are a number of ways of thinking about that. So I looked at the literature and took the CT screening days, Branzawoski's article about looking at the healthy patient. And so you looked at 1,777 patients, and in about one-third of cases, there was a finding seen. The majority of these incidental findings were pulmonary nodules, but there were also cancers, aneurysms, gallstones, ovarian lesions, and the like. One third. This article by Nadeau was looking at CT angiography for the abdomen and lower extremities, and 15% had undiagnosed highly important findings. Now, one of the things you recognize in that article, highly important findings um, were considered to be of moderate importance, high importance, of low importance, and the majority were of low importance. But there still were indeterminate renal lesions. There were lung lesions. There were liver lesions. And overall, eight patients had findings that required subsequent therapy, including cancers. So again, you will find a number of patients, and here was that list from their article. There was another article written by Song, who was looking at patients with hematuria, and said how often would you find incidental findings. And remember, the kidney is a very common site for incidental findings, so anything with the kidneys in the study was considered not incidental, but there was still 6.8% of the cases. So indeed, it is going to be important, 
you're going to find things, most of them are not going to be critical. When you start looking and saying, what's the percent? Well, I'll tell you what the answer is. It depends on where you're scanning, the reason for doing the study, whether you're giving oral contrast or IV contrast, the age of the patient and who is reading the study. I know people who can't read a scan without finding something. Uh, sometimes you check the residents and every patient has a lung nodule. The older the patient, we do TAVRs. It's more common to see incidental findings in older patients because they have aneurysms, they have incidental renal cells, they have lung nodules. So the older the population, the more likely you're going to find an incidental loma. I think you will find more incidental lomas with IV contrast than a non-contrast because things stand out better. And this article on TAVRs recently published 17%. And amongst these, most were still in unimportant, but others were indeed important, including cancers, and that indeed has been our experience. This article, eight malignancies, with five of them incidentally diagnosed, which changed patients' management. So again, it's something that we're going to see on a daily basis. Now you look at all of the five articles I mentioned, and you could see that the majority of the findings we pick up are really unimportant or of not clinical significance are not really changing the patient's management. But others are important. So with incidental lomas, that's the key to us. How to determine its significance, which ones do we need to follow, which ones do we need to pursue aggressively, what do we tell the patient, who pays for these studies. And again, most are not insignificant, but there were aneurysms and carcinomas and lung cancers and PEs and pancreatic lesions, cystic in nature. It's a challenge. And in the ER setting, for example, what do you do? Often the studies are done on contrast. You really are uncertain. Do you need to give contrast to everybody? Do you need to call patients back? ER is very quick. There's minimal records. There's no history. Uh, we know renal lesions are very common. We learned that high density cysts are very common. So a lesion above 70 Hounsfield units, well defined and non contrast, is a leave alone lesion. And here's a good example look at the left kidney. Uh, lesion anteriorly, 67 Hounsfield units, plus or minus 13. And anything in that range is going to be a benign high density cyst. Things between 20 and 70 are more concerning. 99.9% .9 is negative if it's above uh, 70 Hounsfield units. So again, very important. There's a number of articles that have looked very carefully at this topic. This article by O'Connor made the point with masses with attenuation on non-contrast between 20 and 70 are concerning. That's where you see the renal carcinomas. So if you see a non-contrast from the ER, stone study, appendicitis, whatever the study, and there's a lesion and it measures 27 Hounsfield units, you gotta bring the patient back. It measures five Hounsfield units, or 90 Hounsfield units, you don't need to worry. Pooler did a similar article and showed that all of his renal cells measured between 20 and 70 on the non-contrast. So again, that 20 to 70 danger zone. So that kind of helps you in the ER setting or wherever you have a non-contrast CT. Under 20, over 70, well-defined, you can probably leave it alone. Otherwise, it's problematic. The other thing that's a challenge in the ER setting is you pick up so many findings after the patient is gone. What do you do with this case? It looks like a mass in the left kidney. Looks solid. Looks solid on the early phase and solid on the late phase. It measured about 85 Hounsfield units. Now what's important about this case, the lesion didn't change densities from arterial to delayed. Now whether you're dealing with papillary renal cell, which is hypovascular or clear cell, lesions always change between phases. Well here, there's no change between phases. So what exactly do you do? When I see that, I'm thinking it's a high density renal cyst. You bring the patient back, you do a non-contrast, and there it is. Little faint calcifications, the lesion measures 85. The lesion was a high density renal cyst. We did not pursue this lesion any further. So again, sometimes you will need to do at least one study on these incidental omas. Now, when you think about incidental omas, you always think about the adrenal. That's really the place. Going back 25 years, incidental adrenal lesions are uncommon. In the old days, we used to follow them very much like we follow lung nodules. 
depending on the articles you read, it's about 5% if you're taking patients in the 50-year-old group, particularly as you're able to look and see smaller lesions. Um, now, this article by Song makes the point that you are going to find a lot of incidental adrenal lesions, but in reality, if you have a patient who has no history of cancer <clears throat> and you see an incidental adrenal lesion, it's going to be benign. Almost always adenomas, sometimes myelolipomas. And in their rule, they felt perhaps there's no need to evaluate this lesion further. Incidental lesions of the adrenal in non-cancer patients are benign, even when they measure more than 10 Hounsfield units. Now, that's not exactly what people are doing, but, you know, one could say they had a pretty good thought process because we see incidental lesions all the time. And, you know, yes, you can say, well, it's an incidental adrenal lesion, 2CM, and maybe the patient has an undiagnosed lung cancer. That indeed is a possibility, but it's a rare possibility. Now, the ACR has been looking at criteria, and here's the ACR. Again, looking at the fact that the question is, how do we distinguish a benign leave-alone lesion from one that needs further evaluation? And in their white paper, they kind of looked at a number of different things. Now, I will admit, what I didn't like is they said, uh, this white paper should not be used to establish the legal standard in any particular situation. One of the reasons I like the Fleischner criteria is although no rule is perfect, if you follow the rule in court, you're safe. So I like standards, even though they're never going to be perfect. I like standards that make common sense, that we can follow, that patients in practice feel comfortable with. So when you look at adrenals, what are you looking at? There's a number of things, size, unilateral, attenuation, enhancement. So typically a lesion under four centimeters, under 10 Hounsfield units is an adenoma. It's a leave alone lesion, okay, no problem. There's a lesion incidental, measurement zero, adenoma. Okay, no problem at all. The problem is we don't always have a non-contrast scan. And so in that same patient, if you would have given contrast and now measure 64 Hounsfield units, what do you do with a two centimeter lesion incidental finding that measures 64 Hounsfield units? You're kind of stuck. You need to bring the patient back if the patient's gone and evaluate that. I know in a non-cancer patient, I already told you it's probably gonna be benign, but I can't call it benign. Now, if you saw this, and we train our techs to pay a lot of attention. If they see an adrenal, they call us, we walk over. And so in this case, I waited 10 minutes. And then if you wait 10 minutes, it should be 15, but at 10 minutes, it washed out more than 50%. So again, um, if you're on top of things, you can solve problems, but often you will need to bring the patient back. If you have an adrenal mass like this and it's fat, it's all fat, that's a myelolipoma, or a little bit of fat and punctate calcification, it's also a myelolipoma. So sometimes you look carefully at the lesion and you could really define exactly what the lesion is. But you need to be careful. Here's a lesion, left the right adrenal. You look at it, incidental finding, eh, doesn't bother me, measures, but it measures 50 Hounsfield units. Can I blow it off? No malignancy, perhaps yes, but give IV contrast and the lesion enhances and it enhances to 164 Hounsfield units. This was a pheochromocytoma. So I think you need to come up with rules, you need to follow the rules. I think assuming that every incidental lesion is benign is probably gonna be true, but I think you're gonna be need to bring select patients back and do an adrenal protocol. There's no way around it. So again, have your strategy in your practice. Now, one of the most common incidental findings these days is pancreatic lesions. And I'm not talking about pancreatic adenocarcinoma, I'm talking about incidental pancreatic cysts, these so-called IPMNs. Depending on what article you read, three to 5% of adults will have incidental pancreatic lesions. The better your scanner, the more likely you will see lesions. And in fact, there's been articles in MR that say 20% of patients have small incidental pancreatic lesions. The question then is, what do you do with them? And that's really a real problem. You can see this article we wrote at Hopkins, 3% of patients incidentally had, almost 3% had these small cystic lesions, and that was on a 16-slice scanner. But what do you do? They kind of look benign. Here's a good example of a cystic lesion in the body of the pancreas. Well-defined one centimeter, 
Do you follow this? Are you worried this will become a malignancy? Or can you just blow it off? What about this one? This is almost two and a half CM. Incidental finding, do you do EUS? Do you biopsy? Do you simply follow this in six months or 12 months? What do you do? Is it the size that matters only? Or what about this one? There's multiple, there's an uncinate, there's a body lesion. When you look hard, there's a tail lesion. They're two to three centimeters, they're well defined. There's no nodularity, there's no septations. What do I do with that lesion? Or this lesion in the pancreatic head, which is in the three centimeter range. Do I need to bring that patient back? There's this thin septation. And this is a subject of great controversy these days. This whole area of IPMNs, uh, it seems to me that we're being overly aggressive. The issue with IPMNs is that potentially they're pre-malignant. There's an increased incidence of cancer because they're in some sense of dysplasia, and perhaps within 10 years, 10% of patients will get a cancer. Now, we're not talking about a main duct dilatation of a centimeter. We're talking about these small cystic lesions. They're more common in older patients. Now, the predictors of malignancy, some people will say over 3 cm, you're resect. And surely if you have pain over 3 cm, you're resect. If they're growing, if they have enhancing mural nodules or enhancing septations, or if patients have unexplained episodes of pancreatitis. So in select cases, I understand why we're aggressive but in many cases, I think we need to be less aggressive. But the question is how, what do you mean less aggressive? Do we follow these lesions for a year, two years, or forever? Right now, there's no specific set of rules because when you look at many of the recommendations is follow the lesions. But how long do we follow? No one is willing to say two years or even five years because you're saying it's a pre-malignant condition potentially, and so five years does not mean it's not gonna be malignant in seven years. So it's a real challenge. Well, the ACR is looking at this. Surgery should be considered for cysts over 3 cm. If a lesion is a serous cyst adenoma, then you worry about it at 4 cm. They're benign lesions, but you will resect them. Patients with simple cysts under 3 cm can be followed but attempts should be made to characterize the lesions with CT or MR. Cysts under 1 cm cannot be further characterized, but can be followed. Uh, again, perhaps in older patients over 80, don't worry about it. Um, in patients with incidental cysts, aspiration is advised to exclude pseudocysts before surgery is performed, and patients must remain asymptomatic during the follow-up period. But you can still see this is recommending follow-up cysts, and it's not giving you too much help in the guidelines. There was an article by the group of Mass General, Sahani. Their guidelines were annual imaging surveillance for benign serous cyst adenomas, small enough 4 cm, and for asymptomatic lesions. Asymptomatic thin-walled cysts smaller than 3 cm, or side branch IPMNs, should be followed for six months and then 12 months after detection. Cystic lesions with more complicated features or with growth rates should be followed more carefully. EUS should be done if there's any concern. But again, this 3 centimeter thing, what do you do with 3 centimeters? Do you operate on everybody? Do you simply follow? At Hopkins, we have a cyst clinic, and again, what we're doing is evolving. Surgery, main duct IPM is easy. Cystic lesion looks like an MCN, mucinous cystic neoplasm is easy. Something is growing, that's easy. But otherwise, it's really a challenge. Uh, we have a cyst clinic. We've looked at what we do. It's multidisciplinary. You can see our recommendations will often vary from the recommendations at the referring institute. Uh, there's lots of data there, and again, we alter management. Though somebody might say, perhaps, are we doing the right thing? Well, we tend to be less aggressive in terms of recommending surgery. We tend to follow up. Management was decreased in 16 patients, including 10 where their recommendation changed from surgery to surveillance. So, it is a challenge with these cystic lesions. Again, when do you do follow up? How often do you do follow up? And when do things change? When do you stop follow-up? That has never been answered. So I think it's something that you need to pay attention to. I think your institution will have different rules, your surgeons, your EUS, the GI people, but I think you need to come up with some rules that make some sense within your practice and follow those rules from patient to patient.
Now, it's interesting, in the old days, we almost never saw neuroendocrine tumors. We commonly missed them. CT was 30% accurate. Now CT is 95% accurate. And so guess what? We're picking up incidental neuroendocrine tumors like this 5-millimeter lesion, very nicely shown. The question is, what do you do with this lesion? Some people say every neuroendocrine tumor should be removed. Now people are thinking the ones under 1CM perhaps should be followed. This case also makes the point about one of the challenges of incidentalomas. So much of incidentalomas will be based on the protocol. This was a patient for the kidneys. And so there's an obvious enhancing lesion in the pancreas, a total incidental neuroendocrine tumor. If you only had venous phase imaging, you would have missed the lesion, okay? So again, the frequency of incidentalomas is dependent on protocols. If you're doing a three-phase study, you'll classify lesions better, but you'll pick up more incidentalomas. So it's really an interesting process about what you do and what you don't do. Now, another area of incidentalomas is the spleen. And one could say, when all is said and done, almost every splenic lesion is benign, right? If, you, if you're incidentally being detected with a splenic lesion, that means you're not febrile. If you're febrile, you can think of an abscess. You can think of lymphoma, weight loss. You can think of metastasis for melanoma. Most lesions that are in the spleen are incidental findings. They're benign. So most can be followed or just ignored. We don't usually biopsy the spleen, and there aren't a whole lot of trick techniques you can use. Clinical history is important, prior trauma, calcifications in the lesion, other imaging findings become important. We can see solitary or multiple lesions. Cis can be small or cis can be large. Hamartomas can be small, hemangiomas can be small, or they can be larger. If patients have malignancies, you're going to see other things typically. It's rare to see primary splenic lymphoma. When you see that the lesion is large, the spleen is irregular, there's no problem. If you have lymphoma, you'll see adenopathy in most cases. When you see a lesion like this, which we do every July, that's a moray pattern of the spleen. That's not a malignancy. You see the incidental FNH in the left lobe of the liver? When you get venous phase, look how nicely the spleen looks. So again, that's not an incidentaloma. That's just a phase-related phenomena. It's important also to recognize that accessory spleens are very common. Usually they're the hilum of the spleen, about two centimeters or less in size. They typically enhance identical to the spleen and can simulate pancreas, renal, or adrenal pathology. Again, it's very important not to overcall the presence of disease, like calling a neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas, where it's really a spleen. The key thing is the comment I made, accessory spleens enhance like normal splenic tissue on both arterial and venous phase imaging. So you see a case like this, could this be a neuroendocrine tumor? Well, they're usually more vascular, and when you look carefully at the spleen, it's enhancing early like the spleen, and on late phase imaging enhanced like the spleen. It was just simply an accessory spleen pushing against the tail of the pancreas. That's very important. I mentioned other splenic lesions from cysts to hemangiomas to hematomas. That's a splenic cyst, nothing to worry about, no need to follow. When they're calcified, think old hematoma. That's not a primary, that's not metastasis, that's incidental finding of no importance. Or this case, multiple cysts of the spleen and a large spleen. Hemangiomas do not behave like hemangiomas of the liver. They're usually small, they can have some enhancement, and you can see multiple in systemic angiomatosis, clippel trenani weber syndrome. Again, their appearance is variable. Sometimes you can be certain it's hemangioma. Most of the time you kind of say, well, it's probably nothing. So here's a ring-like lesion, looks like a hemangioma, and here's multiple low-density lesions. Could this be cysts? Well, they're not sharp enough. This patient had a clippel trenani weber, so it made it very easy to reach the diagnosis. But you can see it's a real potential challenge, right? Now, if I ask you what processes involve the liver and spleen, we talk about things like sarcoid, obviously lymphoma, metastasis, infection. But again, incidental findings, make sure you think about sarcoid. Yes, I know this could be metastatic melanoma, and I know maybe lymphoma. Same thing in this case. But I want to tell you, incidental finding of multiple splenic lesions or splenic and hepatic, think about sarcoid. Again, a great mimicker. 
and up to 59% of patients with SAR could have splenic involvement. Often the diagnosis is not known, so very, very important diagnosis. Now another thing which in some ways is incidental, but important are splenic infarcts. Now, splenic infarcts, like almost any infarct, tends to be wedge-shaped. We can see splenic infarcts in patients who are examining for fever, abdominal pain. You can see it on the lower scan of the chest CT. So it can be an incidental finding, but it can be important because it may be the first sign to us that the patient has endocarditis or we're looking for that. And so the appearance can be focal, can be multiple lesions, or can be diffuse, or can be solitary. Nice example of a splenic infarct. Uh, splenic calcifications can occur with long-term infarcts. Sickle cell disease has autoinfarction of the spleen early in life, before age 10, and the spleens can indeed be very small. You look at this, that's an incidental finding of splenic calcification. Patient has sickle cell disease. As I mentioned, things like splenic abscesses are rare, but the patients do have risk factors. They are symptomatic you're not going to look at this lesion as an incidental finding. It's irregular. Now, if you're not saying this is an abscess, you're saying it's lymphoma. Regardless, that will need to be worked up. And when patients have multiple tiny lesions like this and they're new, you're thinking infection, but this is a bone marrow transplant patient. So you're thinking about candidiasis, you're thinking about other fungal infections like aspergillosis. So that becomes very important. Now, I think another challenging area with incidental findings is the ovary. And again, this is very challenging in the sense that some cases like this, large cystic ovarian mass, that lesion is coming out, okay? That was an ovarian cyst adenocarcinoma. That's not a problem. And we pick up incidental ovarian cancers all the time. But what do you do with this patient who's 27 with bilateral ovarian cysts? Well, the reality is, Ovarian cysts are very common in young patients. A number of articles have looked at this, and the ACR has looked at it trying to reach some rules. And I'll tell you, it's kind of tricky. So what did they recommend? The range of normal ovarian size varies as a function of hormonal status. In premenopausal patients, ovaries up to 20 cm in volume are within normal limits, whereas in postmenopausal patients, the upper 95% confidence is a 10 cm volume. Well, what does that mean in terms of measurements? That means five sonometers for premenopausal and three sonometers or so for postmenopausal women, with the size of the ovary normally decreasing progressively after 30 years of age. So that means on CT, if you see a 5 cm lesion in a 28-year-old, do not recommend evaluation at that point. What the committee recommends is short interval follow-up for premenopausal patients in six to 12 weeks and for benign lesions in older patients, 3CM, again, waiting. And the reason you want to wait is to see, particularly in younger patients, if there's any change. When an incidentally identified benign appearing cyst in a woman in early postmenopause is over 5CM, the committee recommends prompt sonographic evaluation to ensure that the small wall nodules have not been overlooked. So again, you really divide this into pre- and postmenopausal. You're much less aggressive in the premenopausal patient than the younger patients. You simply follow them because invariably it's almost always a simple cyst. Postmenopausal, when you start getting over 3 cm, you indeed worry. The committee also recommended for cysts under 1 cm in maximum size in any phase of the postmenopausal period, they should be considered benign unless there are suspicious other imaging findings. In late postmenopause, the committee does not recommend prompt or follow-up ultrasound of an asymptomatic benign appearing cyst under 3 cm. Okay, so th that is a recommendation. It's interesting, the uh, Society of uh, Radiologists and Ultrasound, their guidelines are a touch different. Um, Overmanagement was what they noticed in uh, premenopausal patients, and undermanagement was seen in postmenopausal patients. There's an article from NYU, radiologist recommendation for management of anexal cysts uh, at ultrasound uh, were adherent to the guidelines only in 59% of cases. It's interesting. Uh, it's a really good look. There are rules, but do people follow the rules? And you can see that there was overmanagement was really the biggest issue. Overmanagement recommendations were made in most instances for hemorrhagic cysts and cysts with a th thin septation. So again, 
you want to be very careful and under management recommendations were made for simple cysts or what look like simple cysts in the postmenopausal patient. So the rule is postmenopausal be more aggressive, premenopausal be more conservative. But again, there are rules and these rules are involving. I mentioned we had 12 features to look at. One of the questions we have was a thyroid nodule, what do you do? Thyroid nodules on contrast scans are very, very uh, common. This white paper looking at this uh, made the point that thyroid nodules are very common on imaging studies of the chest that include the neck. There is currently a paucity of guidance from professional organizations on management and high variability by radiologists in reporting this. Uh, when you look carefully, these incidental thyroid nodules can be seen in up to two-thirds of ultrasound studies and up to 25% of contrast-enhanced CTs of the chest and up to 20% or so of CTs of the neck. So it's a very common finding. Now, what do you do? Well, if you start referring patients, all of a sudden you see biopsies. Well, the problem with biopsies, the biopsies are often determinant. Biopsies can lead to complications. Uh, again, the rate of benign results is so high because cytology is limited for the diagnosis of follicular neoplasm and suspicion for follicular neoplasm. So there are complicated charts. This was the ACR chart, but let me give you the take-home message. Take-home message in patients under age 35, incidental lesion on CT or MR or ultrasound, committee recommends further evaluation with dedicated thyroid ultrasound if the nodule is over a centimeter and has no suspicious imaging features and if the patient has a normal life expectancy. If the patient's over 35, then what they recommend is further evaluation with ultrasound if the nodule is over 1.5, so they raise the numbers and has no suspicious imaging features and a normal life expectancy. So you can see, and there's another recent article, no definitive guidelines for management of thyroid lesions on CT. And here, this article tried to look at perhaps coming up with recommendations. And again, there were statistically significant associations on multivariate analysis between indeterminate benign nodules and CT characteristics of smaller size, lower attenuation, and homogeneous in composition. And this article by Lee went on to talk about the malignant prevalence of incidental lesions was about 1%. Uh, statistical significant associations were found between CT and ultrasound with regard to lesion number, dominant size, consistency and appearance, and associated calcifications. And they came up with the conclusions that basically said recommending sonographic ultrasound evaluation of all incidental thyroid nodules is not likely the appropriate strategy given the high prevalence of thyroid incidentalomas, low probability of malignancy, and cost-effectiveness of workup. Small, homogeneous, low attenuation lesions have a high probability of being benign. So you can see that there's still lots of controversy, and with the thyroid nodules, I tend to mention them personally, but I don't recommend for the small nodules further evaluation. Some people always recommend ultrasound. Invariably recommend ultrasound, the lesions are going to be indeterminate, then you're going to see a biopsy. The biopsy will be negative. Do you do more biopsies? Do you remove the lesion? It becomes a very big problem. And if it really was cancer, most of the cancers that are detected incidentally are low-grade tumors with a five-year survival of 50 years. So you can create more problems by reporting these lesions and chasing them than by doing nothing. So I think this is one of the real quandaries. Thyroid incidentalomas are really problematic. Now the whole area of incidentalomas is going to be more of an issue as we focus on decreasing dose because the less phases you have, the harder it is to be certain what a lesion is. We need to minimize dose to our patients, but it does have certain consequences. Also, when you have low-dose protocols, it may not impact lesion detection in select studies like colon, virtual colonoscopy, or long nodule follow-up, but it may increase the uh, false positives in other areas, like looking at the liver. So again, everything is somewhat of a challenge. Although multiphase acquisitions are not always necessary, in many cases they're critical. And if you don't do the study correct, you're going to have more incidentalomas. 
and you'd be chasing a lot more things and adding on second and third studies, where if you do the study right the first time, you're going to figure out what all the lesions are. You're not going to generate more incidental omas. I think single-phase studies, which are often all that's necessary, do increase the uh, number of incidental omas that are present. Now, I'll go back to the initial statement we made that the agreement is lacking within institutions and between institutions, and that really is very problematic. I think guidelines are critical. I know there's no perfect guideline, but at least have some semblance of guidelines in your own institution. Come to some conclusions. Everyone follows the Fleischner Society. Hopefully, there'll be more things. The ACR is working on this. I think it will make everyone's job a little bit easier. A good article by Berlin, uh, looking at the white papers and people looking and reading the white papers, the white paper led to 560 radiologists to recommend additional imaging less often and 33 to represent or recommend imaging more often. So you can see once you have guidelines, people feel more comfortable. And by reading guidelines, they tend to feel more comfortable saying highly benign or likely benign as opposed to recommending additional studies. So again, I think we're improving. I think incidental omas are a challenge. They will always be a challenge, but I think we are getting better. So some of my conclusions, you need to come up with some sort of guidelines in your department. Organized radiology needs to take the lead. And again, the Fleischner Society is the best example of where leadership has been most helpful to everybody. We recognize that no guideline will ever be perfect, but again, it's critical for us to have guidelines to help manage patients. And again, we don't want to see articles like the New York Times talking about the problem with medical scans. We need to solve those problems or at least minimize those problems because as we scan patients who are getting older, we're only going to find more lesions. Now, CT is very good for picking up incidental lesions that are critical. There's no doubt 70% of renal cells are picked up incidentally. There's no doubt we all pick up incidental lung cancers and colon cancers and pancreatic cancers and aortic aneurysms. So we are finding things that are saving lives on a daily basis daily basis, but we want to be certain that we don't take things too far and start chasing things that aren't necessary. And with that, I thank you for your attention.